He is risen. He is risen indeed. This morning we start our Easter Sunday with a baptism. Baptism is a beautiful symbol of Easter. Just as Jesus died and was placed in the grave and arose three days later, when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we die to an old way of life. Therefore, baptism symbolizes a burial. But we also are raised in a new life with Christ. So as Mia is raised up out of the waters, it symbolizes her new life she has found in Christ. This is Mia Acosta. And Mia, because you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, in obedience to his command, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we begin worship today, please hear these words. Joyful is the sound we make this morning, for this day liberates us from doubt and fear. Thankful is the song we sing, for this day moves us past darkness and despair. Hopeful is the prayer upon our lips, for this day awakens in us long-awaited new life. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Christ lives here and now. He is among us at this and every moment. Christ is risen. He is king on this and every day. Crown him with many crowns. Let us worship God. Good morning. I'm going to ask you to help me this morning with the crown hymn with many crowns that we just heard Melissa read about in your worship bulletin. You will find an insert. On the top it says crown hymn with many crowns. There are four verses. Second verse is for the men. Third verse is for the women. And then everybody can join on the fourth verse. Please sing out and you can remain seated and help us out with this anthem. Good morning.
Father, we come into your presence this morning singing your praises, because this is the day. This day, Lord, you sent your Son for each and every one of us to die on a cross and to be raised from the dead. This is the day we have come to celebrate a life given for each and every one of us here. And we pray that as this service continues, that all of our hearts and all of our minds will be focused on on that, that you gave your life this day. Would you please join me as together we sing the Lord's Prayer. <laughs>
peace be with you. Welcome to First Baptist Church this glorious Easter Sunday. We are so glad that you're here, and we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome. So let's turn and greet one another in the name of Christ. Good morning. Good morning. Today's Old Testament scripture reading comes from the book of Psalms, chapter 118, verses 1 through 4, and also verses 22 through 24. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His let steadfast love endures forever. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes, and this is the day that the Lord has made. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the prayer of Easter. O Lord, let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks, great God, for the hope we have in Jesus, who died but is risen and rules over all. We worship you, Jesus, our Savior. You conquered death by your cross. You are the stone rejected by the builders. You have become the cornerstone Make all of us living stones in your church. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's new 
scripture reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. with me. 
And now, our God, we have gathered on this Lord's Day, but this special Lord's Day as well. For as in each Lord's Day we celebrate the reality of the resurrection, this day in particular, we recognize and exalt ourselves in the truth that all that you are and all that you have chosen to do for us is summed up in resurrection. Resurrection reminds us of the reality that one day you chose to become like we are in order that we might become like you are. You chose to take upon yourself the form of humanity, to live among us, to be as frail as we often are frail, to be as helpless as we often are helpless, to be as broken and confused as we often are confused, and to reach through all of that humanity and point us towards the reality of the truth that in our origins we are created in your image and in your likeness, and we are intended to be ultimately like you. The resurrection reminds us that in the miracles that you performed, you showed us that suffering, while it is very real and very tangible, is not ultimate, that healing is possible, that restoration is possible, that renewal is possible, that life can be transformed and made whole despite all of its brokennesses and all of its sufferings. In, its, in your teachings, you have shown us an ethic, a behavior, a way of conducting ourselves in a spirit and in an ethics of love where we may choose by your grace not to be centered upon ourselves but upon you. We may choose by your grace not to put ourselves first, but to recognize the needs of those around us. Where we may choose by your grace to reach out and care for those who hunger, for those who thirst, for those who are broken and imprisoned, that we can be a light in the world in which we live, and that we can offer your transforming grace and love in every possible way. And so this day, as we celebrate the resurrection. We remember once again that we continue to live in a world that is as needy as the world in which you chose to incarnate yourself. And as the body of Christ, as the extension of that incarnation, we're called to be and to say and to do all that you were and all that you said and all that you did. And so as we worship together here in this place today, we pray that we will go forth in a while with a renewed commitment to share together the good news that you are risen, that you are risen indeed, and because of that, we live in a world that is filled with hope.
Dear Father, as we come together on this beautiful, holy day, we remember a day long, long ago when you arose from the dead and gave us the gift of life eternal. As we bring our gifts today, please use them and us to your service. Amen. On this glorious Easter morning, please remain standing for the gospel reading today. This morning's gospel comes from the book of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, Easter fools. <laughs> it is Easter and April Fool's Sunday together. And though we don't want to be sacrilegious, I know some who are celebrating both. So far this morning, I've been told that I have a flat tire on my car. I don't. I was told there are goldfish in the baptistry. There are not, though there are quite a few ladybugs enjoying a swim up there. What is your favorite April Fool's joke? Do you like to cut out a little picture of a roach and stick it on the inside of a lamp so that it 
shines when the lamp's turned on. Maybe you'd like to take an air horn and attach it to the bottom of someone's chair so when they sit down, the pressure comes, it alerts them to, to April Fool's. Or as I read in one writing, someone took some onions, dipped them in caramel, and put them out, and everyone thought that they were caramel apples. Do not try any caramel apples today. You know, in my last church, there were some teenagers that decided to play an April Fool's joke on their principal. They took some chickens, and they numbered them. They put on them one, two, and five. They released them in the high school. And all day long, the poor principal looked for chickens number three and four. <laughs> they did not exist. Both the students and the principal were in my congregation. Some thought it was funny, and one person did not. <laughs> it is April Fool's. And you know, Easter, when you look at it, almost seems as if someone were pulling a prank. Look at Mary Magdalene. She is filled with grief, and who would pull a prank on someone like that? And yet, as she approaches the tomb, the stone has been rolled away, and she goes and she gets Peter and John, and they come running, and they look in, and it seems as if there might be something wonderful here. Well, they turn and they go home, which I just don't quite get. And then there are angels who ask her, Mary, why are you weeping? Now, I would think she would recognize an angel, but there are so many tears in her eyes, she does not get it then either. And finally, Jesus says to her, Mary, why are you weeping? And she does not even recognize him. And so she says this, she says, if you have taken away his body, tell me and I will go and take care of him. If you are pulling a horrible joke here, let me know and I will fix this. It never occurred to her in the moment that Jesus might be alive. Peter and John are two of his closest disciples. And yet Peter had denied Jesus three times and he stood dumbfounded at this empty tomb not even knowing what to do. And John, who had stood at the foot of the cross, and Jesus had said to John of his mother Mary, this is your new mom, and this is your son, did not understand all that was going on, although he seemed to get it somewhat. And yet they both go and they lock themselves away in fear until Jesus appears to them again. Oh, Thomas also seemed like one of those Easter fools. He was not there when Jesus came to disciples and told them that he was alive. And he says to them, unless I can put my fingers in his hands and in his feet where the nails were, unless I can put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas was obviously from Missouri, the show me state. Unless I can do it. And it's not until Thomas encounters Jesus as a risen Lord that he falls down and says, My Lord and my God, and he believes. Easter has made fools out of many. Look at those who tried to take Jesus' life. How about Annas and Caiaphas? Annas, who is a father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest at the time. He had been plotting against Jesus because he saw Jesus as a threat to the temple. Annas is one of those shadowy characters who's in the back, who's always plotting, falsifying evidence, recruiting false witnesses, planning a spy in the inner circle, tracking the movements of Jesus throughout the week. And then as Caiaphas has Jesus before him, he asks question after question and has him struck across the face, and he cannot get the confession he wants and he knows he cannot kill Christ, or he does not have that power. So he sends him off to Pontius Pilate. And Pilate questions Jesus again. And he goes out to the crowd, and he says, This man is innocent of the charges. And they say, No, release Barabbas and crucify Christ. And you remember, Pilate washes his hands 
in front of the crowd and says, I wash my hands of this innocent man's death. And he has guards placed at the tomb. And those guards, those soldiers, they are also made Easter fools. For they are there with all of the power of Rome to hold that tomb closed. And yet the earthquake comes and the angels appear and the stone is rolled away. All of the powers of earth could not keep Jesus in the grave. They could not wipe away his teachings. They could not change the miracle of the resurrection. They were made into Easter fools. As Paul would write to the Corinthians, For the foolishness of God is wiser than the human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. For the message of the cross is foolishness, to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. Easter calls for us to be fools as well, but a different type of fool, a fool for Christ. Look at Peter. He goes back to his fishing, and when Jesus calls him back after the resurrection and says, you are to go and to start my church, Peter does something that seems foolish to all. He walks away from a thriving business and he founds the church. Peter, who was just a fisherman, who had no real education that we know of, went out and began to preach at Pentecost and thousands came to Christ through his preaching. John, John became a prolific writer. John focused us on the love of God and kept telling us to love one another as Christ has loved us. And John is exiled for his beliefs in Christ to an island called Patmos. The world thought he had gone mad when he wrote down the revelation, but it is what tells us of Christ's return. And then all of those who began to come to Christ, those earliest Christians, the world said that they were fools. For they went and they sold all they had and they brought it to the disciples' feet. They said, anything we have, anything we are, are to be used by Christ. And they lived together in Koinonia, in a fellowship where they shared all. Foolishness, we would call it. And down through the ages, we see people who have been fools for Christ. St. Francis of Assisi is known as Christ fool. He left a fortune. His father was very wealthy and yet he rejected his father's wealth and he turned and said, I will serve Christ in poverty. And those around said, he's gone crazy. St. Francis, who was afraid of illness, once saw a leper, a person whose skin was literally deteriorating and falling off and in the compassion of Christ, he went and he hugged him and embraced him because he thought that what Christ would do. And they called him a fool. St. Francis would go and he would preach up to five times a day until his voice was gone. And we would tell the people it is not about religious belief. It is not about the great cathedrals. It is about the living Christ. And the religious leaders of the day said, he's a fool, do not follow him. And St. Francis says God loves all, and he even blessed the animals. And people said, he's gone crazy. We know about St. Francis from the Western Church, but have you ever heard of Simeon the Holy Fool from the Eastern Church? Simeon was a monk, a hermit in the 6th century. He lived in Mesopotamia, and for 29 years after his conversion, he went out into the desert and prayed and prayed and prayed until he heard the voice of God saying go back into Esma go back and be my witness go back and help those who are hurting minister to the needy and Simeon thought I do not want anyone to give me credit for anything and so he came up with a plan he feigned insanity he came to town and the first thing he did was he went into the church and he went forward and he extinguished the candles on the altar. He turned around and he began to overturn tables where they had baked goods set out. 
he picked up some cashews and some nuts and began to throw them at people. Now, if I did that this morning, you would say, he's a fool. He's an idiot, and that's what they said of Simeon. And yet, he continued to pray fervently. And because there was something different about him, those who were in need began to seek him out. And they learned that his prayers had great power. He never did ministry publicly. He always showed the face of a fool. But when people came to him privately, Simeon would witness to him. They did not ever figure out what a great minister he was until his death. When they had his funeral, person after person got up and spoke about the ministry of Simeon and how he had given to them when they were in need, how he had prayed for them and had changed their lives. When I was about to graduate from high school, my friend Jeff was one of those we wondered what he would do. And the reason we wondered was because Jeff had the highest SAT in the school. He was the smartest kid there, and we all knew it. He had multiple scholarships waiting on him, full rides to schools like Georgia Tech, and we all thought he was going to go and be an engineer until one day in Sunday school he announced to us, I'm going to Bible college. And his parents and everyone else said, he's being foolish. He's got such a great intellect. Why would he go off and just study Scripture? And Jeff said, because God has spoken to me and told me to minister. What about you? Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 4. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. We are, you are honored, but we are dishonored. To this very hour we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless we work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this very moment. The Apostle Paul says that he has chosen to live a life that the world calls foolish. Because instead of seeking his own, he always sought Christ always giving love in return even for hate what would it look like for us today to truly be fools for Christ would we take his commandments seriously would we love each other as he has loved us would we extend that love not only to those who are in this church but to everyone we meet would we show that great love of Christ would we follow his great commandment to go into all of the world and to preach the gospel? Would we reach out to the weakest in the world? Would we feed the hungry? Would we take strangers into our house? Would we clothe the naked? Would we visit the sick? Would we visit those who are even in prison and tell them of God's love? Would we dare to seek reconciliation? with those who have sinned against us because we have sinned against God and in Christ Jesus we have been reconciled to God. Oh, it sounds so foolish to live our lives not for our own sake but for the sake of God. Brother Andrew was born in the Netherlands in 1928. He grew up very poor. There were seven children in his house, and his father was almost deaf and had trouble working. He grew up, and he became a Christian missionary. He decided that his calling was to smuggle Bibles into communist countries behind the Iron Curtain in the height of the Cold War. And if you read stories of Brother Andrew, time and again you will find adventures where he was almost caught, where he was almost imprisoned, where his life was in danger, and people called him a fool time and time again. And one day when he was preaching, he looked out and he said this, I am a fool. 
I am a fool for Christ. Whose fool are you? You see, we all do things that are foolish from time to time. But will we be made fools for our own sake and in the end lose all which would be the most foolish thing of all? Or would we choose to be fools for Christ who was raised in the power of the resurrection and gives to us the power to live lives freely no matter what the world says about us? We, fools for Christ. This morning we come to our time of invitation, a time when you might give your life to Christ. What better Sunday than Easter to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Maybe you're already a Christian and you need a church home, and this would be the church home that God is calling you to. You might say, it, it intimidates me to walk the aisle, Pastor. Be a fool for Christ. I promise you, you will be welcomed. You will be loved. If God is leading you, would you come and make your commitment this morning as we sing our hymn of commitment? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Take that sentiment, that power of Christ that brings to us all new life, and go and live in that life. As you go this morning, the ushers are at the door because this is our first Sunday, our Alm Sunday, when we take up for those who are in most need in our community. I urge you to give generously. Go and live as fools for Christ. Would you remain standing? for the Hallelujah Course.